morning, Crossroads Community Church. How's everyone doing today in this house? Amen. Welcome. If you're watching us online, we want to welcome you to the 9 o'clock service. I want to encourage you to go ahead and share this. We are excited that you chose to worship with us today. We're excited that you're here today. Are you Valley Campus? We want to welcome you. We have a lot going on at Crossroads. Let's take just a second and check out what's going on through our announcement video. Good morning, Crossroads Community Church. I hope you're excited to be here as we are. We have a lot of events going on here at Crossroads. Part of our growth track is baptisms. We are conducting baptisms next Sunday. That's September 27th. If you're interested in getting baptized, sign up on your trusty Church Center app. Make sure you get signed up. Reach out to us. Let us know that you want to be baptized. Also, October 4th is the next welcome experience. So if you're new to Crossroads and you haven't attended that part of the growth track, and you want to learn a little bit more about what the church does and why we do it, meet the pastors and learn a little bit of our vision, you want to sign up for the welcome experience. That's October 4th. You can do that on your app as well. Lastly, Celebrate Recovery. That is our Christ-centered 12-step program for helping individuals who struggle with hurts, habits, and hangups. And we meet every Tuesday here at the church at 7 o'clock. Come check us out. If you're struggling with anything at all, come check us out. Raise a hallelujah. Save your change, change your dollars, change your dimes. Save them all. Put them in a little baggie, a little box. Bring them October 4th. We are going to build churches, schools, hospitals, in third world countries where they can't do it for themselves. This is a way that we get to be the hands and feet of Jesus through the church of the Nazarene. Alabaster Sunday is October 4th. Bring your change, bring your dollar bills, bring whatever you got, and let's uh, help change the world. October 20th, another way to help um, reach out and be the hands and feet of Jesus is Church Under the Bridge. If you have not been a part of this, it is an amazing ministry where we get to help feed the homeless of San Antonio. San Antonio has a massive homeless problem, and during Corona, many places have shut down um, their food programs, and so there are even more that are going without food. We need your help. Sign up today for October 20th. Hey, Crossroads, I wanted to mention Lifelines once again. It's an awesome way to grow in your relationship with the Lord and your relationship with the body of believers in this church. We have something for everybody, so I just want you to download the Church Center app, read those descriptions, and sign up for a Lifeline today. I personally lead the Life Young Adults Lifeline. We are going through a relationship goal series. We are on session four now. It's going to be awesome. So I want y'all to sign up for that. That's for anybody who's 18 to 25 years old. So if you're interested in that, we do have that on the app. And also after that, we will be having a relationship goals panel where we have several couples and singles uh, talk about their experiences as a couple and uh, being single. So it's going to be an awesome event. It's going to be October 9th. That's a Friday night at 7 p.m. So you do not want to miss it. Mark it on your calendar today. a shout this morning. i 
Love is strong and it's furious. Love is sweet and love is wild. And it's waking hearts to life. Love is deep and love is wide and it covers us. Love is fierce and love is strong and it's furious. Love is sweet and love is wild. And it's waking hearts to life. Love is deep, love is wide, and it covers us. Love is fierce, and love is strong, and it's furious. Love is sweet, love is wild, it's waking hearts Love is deep, love is wide, and it covers us. Love is fierce, and love is strong, and it's furious. Love is deep, love is wide, it's waking us alive. Oh, yeah, yeah. Love is deep, love is wide, and it covers us. Love is fierce, and love is strong, and it's furious. Love is sweet, love is wide, it's waking us Love is deep, and love is wide, and it covers us. Love is fierce, love is strong, and it's furious. Love is sweet, love is wild, and it's waking hearts to life. Oh, sing it one more time. And love is deep, and love is wide, and it covers us. Love is fierce, and love is strong, and it's furious. Love is sweet, and love is wild, it's waking hearts to love. Why don't you give the Lord a praise offering this morning? Today is Freedom Sunday, and uh, Freedom Sunday is a, a day of the year that we take to focus uh, our mind on, on the trafficking that is going around the world. So we got a video for you. Why don't y'all go ahead and take a seat, and uh, let's take some time here. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. In our world today, experts estimate that 40 million children, women and men are victims of slavery. Human trafficking is a crime that turns people into commodities to be bought and sold. It's not only something that happens far from home, it's also happening where we live, in our own communities. Every person victimized by trafficking is a child of God, dearly loved and made in His image. It's time to come together as a church to take a stand against human trafficking. It's time to help those who are oppressed go free. Good morning. Good morning. Try that again. Oh, good morning. Um, 
We are talking about human trafficking today, which is a difficult conversation, and I'm here to talk to you about it. Um, so human trafficking is slavery. It's the illegal sell and trade of humans. Through force, fraud, and coercion, people every single day are being sold and traded and bought. And it's happening right now as we are here worshiping in church. And phrases like slavery and human trafficking are vague. So I'm going to give you a little bit of reality today that's hard. Slavery is violence. It's physical, verbal, and sexual abuse. It's prostitution and brutal working conditions. According to Nazarite Compassionate Ministries, there are 40.3 million victims of human traffickers. And of those 40.3 million, only 1% of victims get rescued. That's a hard statistic to know, but now you know. Human trafficking is the fastest growing criminal industry in the world. $150 billion are generated through this industry. There's sex trafficking, which I think a lot of us are most familiar with. There's forced labor, bonded labor, coerced labor, and child soldiers. And human trafficking, like you saw in that video, happens all over the world. Unfortunately, the United States is not exempt. And the United Nations said that every single country in the world has been affected by human trafficking. So here are some ways that people are trafficked for us to know. We can't fix a problem or fight for this problem if we are unaware of this issue. False job advertisements sold by family members thinking they're in a good relationship when they're not, trafficked by a trusted friend, or false immigration. But the good news is that there's different organizations that are fighting the good fight to help these victims. Organizations like the Nazarene Compassionate Ministries, the U.S. government, and our Rescue Coalition are all organizations that are spreading advocacy or they are going in and getting these victims rescued. And the victims aren't just, they're not gender specific, they're not age specific, they're women, men, and young children. And I'm gonna reread that verse that it said on that screen. It said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captive and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Luke verse, chapter four, verse 18 through 19. So there are many ways to help, and we're here this Freedom Sunday to learn about those, to be advocates for human trafficking, and to spread awareness. And so the first step, like I said, is becoming aware, becoming knowledgeable. And we can't fix a problem if we don't know it, so we can pray, we can spread advocacy, and we can support organizations that are helping fight human trafficking. So according to the United Nations, Poverty countries, countries in poverty less developed, are more likely to be human trafficked. So after this next video, we're going to have a way for you to sponsor children in poverty countries, such as the Philippines, Romania, Ukraine, where they have much more of a chance of becoming human trafficked than less um, than privileged countries. So we're going to watch this video, and it'll show you ways on how to see human trafficking and how to report it. Thank you. Today, if you saw somebody chained to a post, you would do something about it. But in the days of the transatlantic slave trade, it was a normal sight to see. It isn't as clear today of what modern slavery looks like. But by knowing the signs of human trafficking, you can help protect yourself and you can help protect others. 
Traffickers would often brand their victims with tattoos, using words such as daddy or cash. Trafficking victims may show sudden changes of dress and behavior. They may suddenly have possessions that they usually can't afford. They may have unusually long work hours. Victims may have new relationships with boyfriends or girlfriends that are noticeably older, and I'm not talking about a few years. Difficulty with making eye contact, especially with men. Victims may have untreated medical problems, such as cuts, bruises, burns, broken bones. They may miss school frequently, make frequent trips. Victims may be unable to speak independently. Other people may insist on answering questions for them, or even translating for them. Victims may even be frightened of authorities, seeing them as the bad guys. To request help or report possible human trafficking incidents, please call the National Human Trafficking Hotline, 1-888-3737-8888. Or text info or help to at be free two three three seven three three. Uh, we go. Just uh, last week, here in San Antonio, there was a a truck found with people being trafficked, all the way down to twelve months old. So this is a very serious thing. And as believers, as Christians, as Americans, we have been given much, and so not much is required. And, uh, and so I want to call you to action. Uh, up on the screen, there is a, a QR code that will take you to a website. The Nazarene Church, the Church of the Nazarene, has a, an organization where you can sponsor children. Amy and I, we sponsor three children. I know the Sunday Night Live group sponsors a child, and uh, we want to encourage you to do the same thing. It's $30 a month, and uh, with this, they get supervision, number one, to help maintain their safety. They get education. Uh, but going through the Church of the Nazarene, they also get scripture, prayer, church, and uh, spiritual help as well. And uh, so I want to encourage you, you can put your camera up on here and get that QR code, get the website, bookmark it for later. If you don't do it now, you can go to the Church of the Nazarene, just look up Nazarene Compassionate Ministries, and you'll be able to find it there. And I encourage you to do it. Uh, you'll get information uh, very regularly. We get pictures, we get letters from the children that we sponsor uh, to let us know how they're doing. And so it's a tremendous ministry, and I can really encourage you to do it. Amen. Let's stand up and let's have a, a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. And Lord, all of us have the privilege of hearing about your love, experiencing your love, the freedom to seek out your love. And Lord, we may take it for granted where there are many who go through such horror that it's hard for them to see you, to hear you, to be exposed to you. And so, Lord, we want to pray for all those that are in captivity right now, all over the world. Lord, we know that you have a plan for their life, and this is not it. But we also know, Lord, that there are no boundaries where you cannot go. And so we ask for your Holy Spirit to go to each one of them, to minister to them, to comfort them. Lord, even if you have to give them dreams in the middle of the night, that they would know that you love them. Or that somehow that you would help them. And then, Lord, be with us. Be with Christians all over the world, free Christians. Lord, be with free nations that we would do all that we can to stop this atrocity. And Lord, we will give you all the glory. Lord, how many prayers are being lifted up from makeshift dungeons, sweatshops, 
in the darkest places of this world. And so we just ask, Lord, we want to stand in the gap and we ask that you would begin to answer their prayer. Lord, we thank you that you're an ever-present help in trouble and that your love is furious and you do go after us and you go after them. So, Lord, our prayer today is that you would chase them hard, relentlessly, furiously. Lord, as we continue in our worship service here today, help us to not take you for granted, to not put things before you. Let us be mindful of the fact that many people simply do not have the freedom we do. So let us not put it on a shelf as if it doesn't exist, but let us take hold of the freedom that we have to worship you. And as we celebrate you today, Lord, may you receive the glory and the honor. Pause our spirit in our heart, Lord. Your word says, be still and know that I am God. Help us to set everything else aside, all of our stress, our worry, our anxiety. And Lord, lift you up and remember that you are glorious. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen, amen. Just give the Lord a praise offering this morning, amen. Love is deep and love is wide and it covers us. Love is fierce and love is strong and it's furious. Love is sweet and love is wild. It's waking hearts to life. Love is deep and love is wide and it covers us. Love is fierce and love is strong and it's furious. Love is sweet and love is wild. It's waking our to life. Love is sweet, love is wild, it covers us. Love is fierce and love is strong, it's furious. Love is sweet, love is wild, it's waking our to life. Love is deep and love is wild. Covers us, love is fierce and love is strong, and it's furious. Love is sweet, love is wild, it's breaking hearts Love is strong and it's furious. Love is sweet, love is wild. It's breaking us alive. Oh, yeah. Love is deep, love is wild, and it covers us. Love is fierce, and love is strong, and it's furious. Love is sweet, love is wild. It's breaking us alive. Love is deep, love is wide, and it covers us. Love is fierce, love is strong, and it's furious. Love is sweet, love is wild, it's waking hearts to
Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Give the Lord some praise. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are thankful for your blood. Lord, we are thankful for what you did. Lord, we are thankful for what you're going to do. Father God, we come to you today, Lord, with a spirit of thanksgiving, excited in anticipation of how you're going to move in this place. I pray today, Lord, that chains are broken. I pray today, Lord, that lives are transformed. And I pray for those that are struggling today, Lord, that are hurting with depression and addiction and anxiety, that you would speak to them today, Father God. And you would heal them today, Father God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said together, amen. You guys may be seated. I just want to take just a second and remind you guys that you can give through the app, that you can give in the giving boxes, you can give online at wordlifechanges.com, but let's just pray. This is the time where we normally take our offering. Let's just pray for our offering. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for faithful and cheerful givers. We thank you for those who are faithful. We thank you for the blessing that you bestowed upon them, that they give back to you, Lord. We want to pray a special prayer for Pastor Lee as he brings the word today, that you would anoint him and guide his words. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. God is good. All the time. Amen. I want to take this second and before I get into the word this morning, remind you about a couple things. One, upper room prayer ministry. We cannot do anything unless the Holy Spirit is in it. And the scripture says that we are to ask the Holy Spirit to be with us. And so I really want to encourage you from 815 to 845, uh, Victoria, right over here, she is running that ministry. Uh, over in the gym building, and then again, uh, 45 minutes before the second service. So whether you come in the morning before this service or stay afterwards, I really want to encourage more people to go and pray. We need uh, just prayer covering this service, the second service all the time. Amen. We can't do anything without prayer. Y'all believe that? Amen. Amen. And, uh, and then secondly, um, well, I forgot the second thing. So that's what happens when you turn 50. You don't, you don't even know. I don't I don't even know what I was going to say. So let's have a word of prayer. We'll get into the word. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy. We ask, Lord, now for your presence to be with us in our mind. Open our minds and let us hear what you want to say to us today. Lord, we ask that you would help our mind to be still, to focus in on you, that we may hear your still, small voice. Lord, we know that the word does not go out and return void, but let us have ears to hear this morning. Lord, we pray for everybody here in this room and everybody watching online that they would have ears to hear. Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be able to do what you want to do. Lord, we praise you and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Everybody said together, amen, amen. amen. The, I want to continue this, this uh, teaching on hate and the hate culture. And I would say as we look around uh, in our world and everything that's going on, that I feel like I can say this pretty easily, love is dying. Love is dying. I don't, I don't mean that people are not saying that they love one another. I'm not saying that people aren't attempting to love one another. What I'm saying is that love defined by scripture, agape love is dying. The scripture says that in the end, the wickedness will grow so cold that it will cause, that, that the wickedness causes love to grow cold. And in, in the King James, it says it waxes cold. Everybody say wax. I don't know if you've ever been to a wax museum, but if you've ever been to one, I mean, they look real. I mean, you think you're looking at Elvis Presley in the face, right? It looks real, but it's not real. It's dead. And that's kind of what we see in our society right now. There's a lot of people talking about love, a lot of people saying we need to love one another, we need to embrace one another. There, there are people uh, constantly pledging their love to one another, but it, it is wax. It's dead. It's not agape. It's not real. It's not from God. 
The Bible says that there is a love that is pagan. There is a love that is outside of biblical viewpoint, which simply means uh, an eternal perspective. We have to look at this and say, how does this affect eternity? The reality is that God, who is outside of time, created time, put us within the bracket of time so that we can live this life. And what's going on here within this bracket of time will determine what our eternity is. And we have to understand that. And so God is doing everything that he can. The Bible says he's working all things together for the good. It it says for those who love him, but I personally believe he's working all things together for everybody. He's trying to figure out how to get everybody right. The Bible says he doesn't want any to to be lost, but he wants all to be saved and go to heaven. Amen? And so I believe that he is working constantly trying to draw all men unto himself. And so we are in this situation, and God is working like that. But at the same time, we have to understand understand it's not just about this it's about that it's about eternity it's about where we're going to spend forever it's about what happens after this are we going to remain in the presence of God are we going to be absent in the presence of God forever and ever now if God is working to draw all men unto him then we have to understand that there is an opposing force there is Satan there is Lucifer there's the enemy whatever you want to call him he is not a figment of your imagination he is not a cartoon character he is a, a fallen angel if you believe in angels you have to believe in demons, and he is constantly working to steal, kill, and destroy, the Bible says. He, he, he is working to steal our salvation. He's working in the church trying to draw you away from God. He's trying to kill your hope so that you have no hope that there is anything better, trying to get you to think, well, everything's lost and nothing's going to get better and nothing can ever happen good. And he is trying to destroy your eternity, trying to destroy what your life will be like afterwards. This is how we have to view it. So when you watch the news, when you read things, when you look at social media, when you look at all that's going on in our world, there has has to be an eschatological mindset. What does this mean for eternity? What does it mean for my eternity, for my children's eternity, my grandchildren's eternity, for the church's eternity? What does it mean? The devil's number one goal is to destroy the church. Destroy the church. Now, if, if there are people who do not believe in Christ, if there are people who do not believe in God, that, that have no desire to follow God, no desire to seek after God, then the enemy, the scripture says, has power over them, has control over them. Now, what does he do with them? He, he is working through them, through selfishness, through the sinful nature, through the carnal nature, to love the way the world loves, which is a selfish love. It's, it's I'm going to have empathy and acceptance for all things without any morality. That's how love has been defined for us now. And, and so the enemy is always working, trying to destroy the church because, number one, the church is, are those that he's trying to draw away from God. This is the, the people who already have faith in Christ are the ones that he's trying to pull away. He's trying to destroy that faith, destroy your eternity. The enemy, the devil, Lucifer, he hates God. And because God loves you, then he hates you. Doesn't matter what you have done, and and, and and it doesn't matter who you are, the enemy hates you and he wants to destroy you. And so he's always working to do this, and, and he wants to destroy the church because the church is the revelation of God. God is invisible, so how can God, an invisible God, reach a people that cannot see him? There have been several things he has done. First, we have cre- creation. We have nature. We have the stars and the sky, the moon. And it points to the fact that there is a designer. There is a higher power. It wasn't just boom and an accident and everything happened. There is a design to it. So it points to a higher power. It points to a God. But then he says, let me give you a further revelation. And he gives us the word of God, the Ten Commandments. He gives us the prophets who teach and who preach. And he does all this. And then he says, let me give you a little more. And he sends his only begotten son who becomes the revelation of God in the flesh. So as Jesus spoke, then we heard the word of God speaking. He says, as you know me, you know the Father. And as you've seen me, you have seen the Father. And it's a revelation. And we have the Bible. We have the word of God that has been written for us, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that is revealing who God is. And so it starts with creation where there is a God, but then he funnels it down and says there is a specific God. He has a character, he has a personality, he has a way, he has a methodology, and it is all laid out through these revelations. The final revelation is the church. We're the body of Christ. We carry the message. 
We are supposed to live the way Christ lives so that we reflect who Christ is. So then when we talk about Christ, people understand who he is. Where the church has gotten messed up is when we have claimed the name of Christ and yet lived like hell. And we have done things that we should not have done and been ways that we shouldn't have been. And we have revealed a clouded, dark reflection of God. And it has made it hard for people to find God because the church has been darkened. And so the enemy is always trying to darken the church, divide the church destroy the church and as a people of God we have to understand that this is a battle this is a fight this is a war this is a why the apostle Paul says make sure you put on the full arm don't go out with half your armor don't just go out with your helmet don't just go out with your weapon you need the whole armor of God because you're up against a very formidable weapon who wants to destroy you destroy the church destroy your children and your children's children and we have to learn how to fight amen Here's what the scripture says. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. The spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. A recent study done by the Barna Group said that less than 1% of young adults have a biblical worldview. What does that mean? If you have a worldview that is biblical, then you believe in these things. I'm just going to list them real quick. You believe in an absolute moral truth. So the younger the people get, the less they believe in an absolute truth. Truth is relative. It's your truth versus my truth and their truth, and there is no real truth. There is no God's truth. There is no set truth. The other thing is that the Bible is, is inerrant. In other words, the Bible is the word of God without error. That Satan is real and not just symbolic. That people have to get into heaven by faith and not through works. That Jesus Christ was an actual person who lived and was sinless. And that God is a supreme creator. Less than 1% of young people between the ages of 18 and 23 believe all of those in the world today. Now, we live in a time where... 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, it would have been almost impossible to find somebody who did not believe these things. And I want you to see how quickly we have moved to where now less than 1% of the youngest generation believes it. 75%, according to the Fuller Institute, 75% of young people leave the church when they graduate high school. What's going on? What's happening? The church is under attack. And if you look at generations and you go from the oldest generation to the youngest generation, you see with every generation there are less and less people engaged, less and less people who believe, less and less people who have a biblical worldview, less and less people in church, less and less people who even claim to have a religion, period. This is what the enemy is doing. This is what the enemy is doing. It's no ordinary time. It's no ordinary time. The enemy hates the church. Now, the Bible is very clear. It says that the church cannot be destroyed. Remember, Jesus saw Peter and he said, Upon this rock I will build my church and not even the gates of hell shall prevail against it. Amen? You all remember that? If you remember that, say amen. That, that means the church will never be destroyed. The enemy is going to attack and attack and attack forever and ever until the end of time. And yet he is never going to win the battle. He's never going to win the battle over the church. There will always be the church of Jesus Christ. It is always going to be present. The question is, is not, is there going to be a church, but who's going to be part of it? That's the issue. The Bible talks about a remnant. There is always a remnant of the people, a remnant of Israel, a remnant of the church, a remnant of people. The, the scripture says there are going to be tons of people on judgment day who said, Lord, Lord. And he's going to say, away from me, I never knew you. Raised in church, attended church, went to church, read the Bible, did all the religious stuff. They, in their mind, think they are calling him Lord, but they never had faith. He's going to say, away from me, I never knew you. This is a... A, a time like no other. But the devil can't make you or anybody else do anything. He can control the atmosphere. He can, he can manifest things that happen in the world. But your response to what's going on around you is totally up to you. 
There's not any excuse. I can't, I can't have any excuse and say, well, it's a hard time and so I did this, you know, or my kid did this and so I yelled at him or my wife did this so I did that. I, there is never an excuse. I have all the control within me. The Bible says he's not giving me a spirit of fear but a power, love, and self-discipline. And so as a believer, the enemy cannot do anything to you. And even in the end, if I'm not a believer, there still has to be something that ha- makes me reject God. And I have that ability. Every single person will be held responsible for their own decisions, for their own thoughts, their own words, for everything that they have done. And so the devil, all he can do is create. The Bible says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, shadows make everything look darker. They make everything look bad, but they are nothing. There is nothing to it. And that's what the enemy is constantly doing, creating these situations that make everything look darker, makes life look darker, creates depression, creates all this kind of stuff. But it's just a facade because Jesus, Jesus is always here. He is the light. He is the hope. He is our joy. He is our portion. He is always here. Amen. And so no matter what things look like, he is always here. Everything else is just made up. It's just a shadow. But it's the church that has the responsibility of lighting the way, shining the light into the darkness. I want to talk to you today about hell's strategy against the church. Hell's strategy against the church. And I want you to look in your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. And, and, and what's going on is the disciples have been walking around with Jesus and they're walk, looking at the temple and they're saying, look how awesome this temple is. It's just beautiful. It's magnificent. And then Jesus says, you need to know that before the end of time, all of this will be torn down. It will all be torn down. And they said, well, how, will we, how do we know? What are the signs? What are the signs that the end is coming? And so this is what he said. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then, everybody say then. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, then the end will come. Amen. Wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes. In another gospel, he's, he's recounting, in the book of Luke, he's recounting the same conversation and he includes pestilence and disease. I think we can look around at all the natural disasters, the sickness, disease, and clearly understand that we're moving that direction. We're seeing love grow cold. We're seeing hatred increase. We're moving that direction. Amen. And, and what it's saying is, is when all of these things begin to happen, it says then you will be persecuted and put to death. Then. In another place it says you will be handed over to the synagogues and handed over to the governments to be flogged and to be put to death. And so there, there's going to come a time, and, it, and, and perhaps it, we're beginning to see it, certainly in other areas of the world that's already there, where Christians are going to be hated. That's just the reality we need to face. I was reading some church history this last week, and, and in the early centuries when somebody came to Christ and they put their faith in Christ, as part of the catechism, as part of their, their basic training, they would teach them how to deal with martyrdom because they so expected to be killed for their faith. Now, we have never seen anything like that. But in the end, we know that this is where the world is going, and Christians are going to be hated. Christianity is going to be made illegal. 
It says you're going to be brought before governors and you're going to be flogged and put to death. So in other words, it's going to be a crime. Your faith is going to be a crime. There are 195 countries in the world right now. 25 of those countries have laws against Christianity. It's just against the law. It doesn't mean there aren't Christians in those countries, but it's against the law. So when they get caught, they are put in prison. 52 countries have been declared by the voice of the martyrs as as countries that will persecute you, put you in prison, put you to death simply for your faith. 25, it's being done by the government. The others, it's being done by the people, but that's the way it's moving. That's not something that we understand. We haven't had our, our, our freedom of religion taken. And, and even with all this COVID and you can't, you know, all of this was temporary and wearing the mask and it was, it was about safety. There, our government has not yet come in and say, you cannot be a Christian. But it's coming. It's coming. I, I fully expect that in my lifetime there is going to be a time when, when whatever I preach up here may be illegal if it gets out. I fully expect that. And so we need to understand this is what's coming. This is how it's happening. But I want to walk you through the process and what, what the strategy is that was born out of hell's strategy room. And so let's look at this for a little. Why, why are we going to be hated? So there's wars, there's rumors of wars, there's pestilence, there's sickness. Why, why are we going to be hated? Who are Christians? What are, what are we trying to do? I don't, I don't mean people that are playing. I don't mean people that are giving God a bad name. But I mean sincere Christians. What are we doing? We're walking around saying God loves you. God loves you. He's got a plan for your life. He loves you. All we're doing is we're giving our money, we're giving our time, we're giving our effort to help the homeless, to help people get out of addiction, to rescue children, to adopt children that don't have a home. We're doing all this kind of stuff, trying to help people. And yet, when all of this really hits the fan, who's going to get blamed for it? Us. Now, that seems so weird. If, if, if all I'm doing is trying to tell people that God loves them and they are loved and I'm trying to love them, why are they going to hate me? Why are they going to hate you? Why will they hate the church? What is it? And so whenever we begin to look at this, the Scripture says that there's going to be wars, rumors of wars and, and pestilence and all this stuff. There's going to be Stress. Pressure, hardship, the divorce rate keeps going up. The abortion rate keeps going up. There's murders. There's rape. There's domestic violence. There's all kinds of stuff. And as we continue to move forward, the wickedness causes people to think there's no hope. And it kills the love. And the wickedness increases. Now, what is the world going to do with this? The world responds to things in a strange way. When when the world sees a crisis, when something happens, there is a moment where the world jumps in and tries to do what seems right. If you remember after 9-11, all of a sudden all the churches were full. With this whole COVID thing, you got companies deciding we're going to make masks and we're going to stop up and everything is, is good and right. But in the end, the stress and the pressure caused people to want to alleviate the pain. And they want to alleviate the suffering and they, they can't deal with the stress. They can't. And so they begin to try to placate and, and try to help themselves deal with the issue by going into and embracing the pleasures of the flesh. And so what happens is people start dealing with this and some go into drugs and, and, and they become addicts and some go into alcohol. Some become workaholics. Some become servantaholics where all they're doing is just serving, 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 but it's really not about Christ. They're just trying to somehow make themselves feel better about what's going on. Some people uh, begin to uh, be exercise-aholics. I've never been accused of that, by the way. I don't, I don't know if there's blue bell-aholics, but there is, it may be me. But we're trying to deal with all this stuff. We, get, we become social media aholics, TV aholics. We become all of these different things, and we get all this stuff trying to get our mind off of what the pressure is and off of what that is. And, 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 and so the world moves into this place where God gets further and further away, and the fleshly pleasures, dealing with the moment, dealing with the issue at the time, trying to make myself feel better. And then what are Christians doing? 
As the world is, is trying to alleviate the pain by moving into flesh, moving into the pleasures of life, and moving into earthly things, trying to satisfy and find meaning in earthly things, Christians, we're saying, we got it right here. This is the end. Repent. Jesus is coming soon. How many times have you heard that lately? Jesus has got to be coming soon. Amen? And, and, and that's been said since Jesus left. And we keep thinking, surely it can't get any worse, and then it keeps getting worse. But that's what we, and so as the world is trying to deal with the pain by moving into to fleshly pleasures, the, the church then is saying, repent. The end is coming, and God has a plan for you, and he wants something good for you. The problem is the more I preach the gospel, I'm also declaring everything that is making the world feel better in the moment is evil, is wicked. God has a plan for you, but you can't keep sleeping around. God, God has a plan for you, but part of that plan means you got to quit getting drunk every day. God has a plan for you. Now, what the world wants is for us to redefine what love is, and love is now total acceptance of everything without morality. And so if it helps you, fine. If that's your truth, if your truth and the way you deal with life is by going out and drinking all the time, as long as you're okay with that, don't hurt anybody else, who am I to say anything? If, if, if what you're doing isn't hurting somebody else, then who am I to say anything? Who am I to judge? And the problem is the morality of God is love. When God gives us the Ten Commandments, he is teaching us how to love. If I love my wife, I'm not going to cheat on her. Amen? If I love the church, I'm going to be faithful to her. If I love my neighbor, I'm not going to go on social media and just rip them because they did something I didn't like. You understand what I'm saying? But there is this mentality is that I am justified to do these things because I'm trying to deal with the pressure. I'm trying to fix the world. I'm trying to make things right. So I'm justified. I was actually on a Nazarene uh, uh, what is it, a quasi-Nazarene Facebook page, and somebody messaged me and they said, I don't have any problem with people breaking into stores, stealing everything if they're starving. It's okay. I, I, I don't know that I would necessarily have an issue if they were truly starving. But I might say, because I remember David, David was hungry and he went in and ate the sacred bread, which was against the law, but God was okay with it. But how, who decides who's starving? Who decides when it's justified and when it's not? Who decides who you can steal from? Who decides how much property can be destroyed? Who decides? Now, this was coming from a minister. And I, and I said, I can appreciate your compassion for the poor. I can appreciate your compassion for the underprivileged. I'm with you on all that. But I don't understand how we can take this suffering and justify injustice to somebody else. Yeah. And what the world is saying right now is in order to make things right, in order to make things just for this group of people, we have to be unjust to a different group of people. There's no morality. And, and, and so we see the enemy trying to do this. Meanwhile, the church is saying, we got to turn to God. We got to turn to God. God's way is the way to do it. And you got to repent and you got to quit living in, in what the Bible refers to as sin. And homosexuality is not the best thing for you. Drunkenness is not the best thing for you. Griping, complaining, moaning, violence. None of that is justified. None of it should. You have no excuse. And God has a plan for you, but he wants to lead you out of that so that you can have transcendental peace that is beyond what this earth has to offer, and the world says, I don't want that. I want my bowl of ice cream. Amen? And you might think, well, why do they care? What does the world care what the church says if they're not believers, if they don't want to be believers, if they don't believe in God, what do they care? Well, let me read this to you out of Romans chapter 2, verse 12. It says, all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Now here's what I want you to see. Indeed, when Gentiles, now Gentiles here is talking about unbelievers, 
who do not have the law do the things by nature required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they don't have the law. I'm talking about the, the Mosaic law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their consciences also bearing witness and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times defending them. This will take place on the day God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. So why does it bother them? Because every single human being has been created in the image of God and has a conscience. He has written on their hearts the difference between right and wrong. Amen? Amen. Now, let me tell you something. When when I want to sit down and have some bluebell, okay, I like a lot of bluebell. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't need a bowl because it comes in a bowl already. It's a half-gallon bowl, right? That's all I need. And, And I can eat that without any quim without any bother, I'm fine. But then the next morning when I get on the scale and the numbers tell me, why would you eat so much bluebell? Now I feel guilty. You see, as the world moves toward all this wickedness, creating pressure, suffering, stress, And so the world looks to relieve itself in fleshly pleasure or in earthly gain that is unbiblical. When the church comes around and says, this isn't right, it's not going to lead where you think it's going to lead. It's not going to bring you the peace you think it's going to bring. Then the voice of the conscious begins to speak up within and guilt happens. And so what's going to happen is as we move forward, the way the world is going to deal with Christianity is that we don't want to hear it. We want to do what we want to do. As long as no one's saying anything about it, as long as no one's throwing it in our face, as long as I don't have to look at the scale and see what I'm doing is wrong, then I'm fine. So let's just get rid of Christianity. Let's just make whatever the preacher says illegal. Now, I don't know how quickly it's going to happen, and I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow, but it's important that we understand what the devil is trying to do to the church. And so all this is happening. The world is going this way, and the church is trying to rescue it. By rescuing it, we're actually bringing up things that make people feel guilty. And then the world is saying, I don't want to hear that. I like getting drunk. I like getting high. I like sleeping with whoever I want to sleep. Love wins. If I want to sleep with another man, another woman, if I want to sleep with a kid, as long as the kid's okay, you leave me alone. It's my truth. And that's the world today. And we're over here saying, but, but the law of God is love. And so if you, if you really want to love somebody, then you commit yourself to them. If you really love other people, you don't harm them. You don't take advantage of them because they don't know any better, because they're too young, or because they've never had any opportunity, so you just work them for nothing. You don't do that kind of stuff because we love our neighbor. Amen? And so the world is getting all this, and now, so the world says, we're sick and tired of you. We're done. And the persecution starts, and it becomes illegal. But here's, here's one thing we have to understand. No matter how much the world comes at the church, we have to remember we hold the hope of the world. There is no other hope outside of the God that we know. And when the world starts trying to tell us that everything that we're seeing is wrong, that it's not right, that it's not loving, it's not good, we we need to understand the laws of God, the morality of God is love. Amen? Now let's get into the scripture. Let me keep going now. What else does it say? It says, then we'll be handed over to be persecuted put to death, be hated by all nations, at that time, everybody say at that time. So as things get harder for the church now, at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. He's talking about in the church. So the world hates us. The result of the world hating us is now there are false prophets and we hate each other. 
How, how, how is this working? You see, when the world starts telling us that we're wrong and they use this logic and, and things seem right and it sounds good and everything's good, and meanwhile, if I don't come over to your side, then I'm somehow the bad guy and I'm going to be mistreated and you're judgmental and you don't love people and you just think everybody is this and that and, and you're treating everybody bad, then there are going to be some Christians say, I don't want to be on the receiving end of that. I don't want to be called, uh, you know, these names. I don't want to be said this about me because I don't agree with that. And so I'm just going to slide on over. And what happens are the fleshly things that the world is going after, that they're saying, okay, there's going to be people in the church say, well, maybe it's not that bad. And they're going to slide over. And then you're going to have false teachers that begin to teach it. We're already beginning to see this. Many churches, many denominations are split, divided. Some of them are formally split over the, the, the issue of homosexuality. A lot of them are split over other social issues like immigration, taxes, politics. And so as the world attacks the church, some people say, well, I don't, I don't want to be the recipient of that. It kind of makes sense. I'll be over here. And then you're going to have teachers come up out of that. And now in the churches you have false prophets teaching things that are not biblical. And what do people in the church do? They begin to hate each other. This is the strategy that I see. Wars, rumors of war, problems, problems. The world moves towards the flesh. The world moves towards selfish gain, trying to find meaning in this life. Christians are saying the end is coming. We got to repent. The end is coming. We got to repent. If you really want the good life, God's way is the good life. So quit doing this, quit doing this, quit doing this so that you can get out of addiction, have a better marriage, be saved and all these things. And, and the world's not going to want to hear it. And then people are going to slide over and say, well, you know, I'm kind of with the world on this one. I'm kind of with the world on this one. Let me, let me give you a scripture here. In, um, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, it says, But there were, also, there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. Denying the sovereign Lord. So in other words, denying that God is sovereign, that he is all. Do you know that's the biggest thing right now in, in this post-secular uh, age that we're in is you can believe in God, you can believe in Jesus, but no one really knows if that's real, if that's true. And so there are now a lot of Christians, a lot of churches teaching that evangelism is wrong. Because how can you go and tell people that Jesus is the way when we don't know? Now my answer to that is because that's what Jesus told me to do. All authority in heaven has been given to him to go and preach and to teach and to make disciples. Amen? And it says, they are denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. Now he's talking about forgiveness. In other words, they're ignoring the sin factor, the fact that we need to be forgiven. This is the strategy. Now what does the Bible say? Those who stand firm. You cannot be relaxed. You cannot be casual. Casual Christianity will be overtaken by this strategy from hell. Casual Christianity where you're half in and half out, where you believe but it's not really important, where you think, okay, Jesus is God, but he's not your God every moment of every day. There's not an urgency. There's not a zeal. Casual. You can't just, just loaf firm. You got to stand firm. You got to be strong. You got to put on the full armor of God. You got to be ready for battle. And if you're casual about it, you're going to be overtaken by this. You got to stand firm. You got to stand firm in your beliefs. When the world starts trying to say, well, that's not what the Bible said. That's not what it meant. Then you need to test the spirit. Find out where is that coming from. Get godly counsel. Get into the word. Know what you believe. You cannot just halfway know the Bible and expect to survive and for your generation after you to survive in your family if you don't know the word. So we got to stand firm in the word. And then when hatred hits the church and when people start coming into the church or when people who have been there start backbiting, fighting, and division, don't be goaded into that. If they want to attack you, you love them. If they want to persecute you, you pray for them. If they want to say this about you, you just build them up with every word you got. 
Amen? And if we can do that, then the church can still be the revelation and reflection of God. And we can still be a place where the love of Jesus Christ covers a multitude of sin. And we can still be a place where people that are broken and hurted can find healing for their heart. Amen. They may attack us everywhere else, but when they need something, they're going to run to God. And if we're being who we are, then the community, the body of believers, that's why we take the Eucharist, that's why we take communion, because it reminds us we're all part of one body. I'm part of the body of Christ. When we become the body of Christ, then there is healing, there is power, and God makes a way, and he helps people. Amen. Stand up and let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your glory. We praise you. Lord, help us to be the church. Help us to be the church that you call. Not the religious church, but the church you call, where we hold fast to the word of God and we stand firm in the love of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we know the enemy is coming against the church in so many places, and it's even creeping into our nation. But Lord, you are greater and you are more powerful. So help us be that place, that sanctuary where the blind see and the lame walk and the mute hear. Lord, help, help us to be that place where marriages are restored, where souls are saved, where minds are sanctified, holy. And Lord, where you lead us into the highway of holiness where there will be joy and dancing and shouting because you are so good and the life you have for us is so good. Be the way maker that we need, Lord. You are the one who makes a way. You're the one who creates a path. You're the one that separates all that other stuff, lights a Way. Help us, Lord, to be the carrier of your light that we can show the way and be who you want us to be. We give you all the glory and all the praise. And everybody said together, amen, amen. Give the Lord a praise offering this morning, amen, amen. You are here, moving in
and I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Darkness, 
Give the Lord some praise. Amen. Hallelujah. He is good. He is good. Amen. If you are a guest here today or if it's your first time coming, we want to welcome you. Miss Gina is in the back. We have a gift for you. Pastor Lee said, no loafing. Stand firm. Go out and stand firm. Amen. You guys are dismissed. Have a great day. To be loved by you, how sweet it is.